successful comedian, an average author, and a terrible actor. And your chance to speak directly with him has arrived. Call 866-969-1969. Jim Norton Show starts now. Good afternoon, or is it morning? Depends on when you're listening to this. I was uh, away last week. As you know, we were on vacation. Had quite a delightful week. And um, why does it not show up on the monitor until, like, how come it shows up in that um, one? Because if one? the calls start coming in before we can load that software for you, oh, okay. they show up on the other ones, just not that one yet. All right. Well, a call, uh, line one, we have a call from Donnie. In Boston. Hi, Donnie in Boston, who's uh, having a writer's block. Is that what it is, Donnie? Yeah, Jimmy. How are you? I'm good, buddy. What is it you write? Uh, I'm a stand-up comic. I've been doing it for seven years. I love it. You're the reason why I got into the business. Oh, thank so, you, man. So thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love my 30-minute set, but I really want to write a new 30 minutes. And uh, everything that I'm writing lately has just been garbage. Yeah, that happens. Um, now, what the th are you trying to take stuff and just kind of squeeze it into your set? Like, you don't have to write a whole new 30 and just start over. You can always just, you know, bring stuff and incorporate it into your set and then add to it. And then you have 45. Yeah, I'm trying to make the next step from feature to... To headliner, yeah. To headline, yeah. And uh, so I, I want to have that extra 30 um, just in case some things just aren't hitting. Do you do any open mics? Um, constantly. Yeah, that's what I try to do. We're, we're something like, or I'll, I'll do the seller. Um, writer's block's a weird thing. Like, the way I do it with stand-up is I kind of have to wait until I'm inspired to talk about something. So after I shot this last special, which we shot at the end of March up in Somerville, um, I couldn't think of anything for probably a month and a half. So I was going on every night just doing, like, fuck jokes and just kind of talking about what was familiar and feeling very uninspired, and I was bombing. And I was walking up the steps every night going, I stink and I fucking hate my act. And then um, finally... I went to a bris, and that's what I've been talking about for a while. And it just affected me so much, I just began talking about it naturally. So I think, for personally, I have to wait until I'm kind of inspired. But just keep exploring on stage. Bring up a few topics you want to talk about and play with. And that's how I did it. You're going to bomb a little bit doing it. but um, you know, Or do an open mic where you don't do any of your regular material. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. Good luck, buddy. I know how it is. Hey. Okay. It'll, 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 it'll clear up, too. Don't worry. Just don't uh, give up. Yes, hi, Rick in Brooklyn. Hey, Jimmy. How are you, buddy? I, I love you, pal. Thank you very much. How I, are you? I, I just want you to know that uh, I'm celebrating three years sober, and uh, I, owe, I owe a lot of it to you. Oh. And uh, I wanted to thank you for that. You know, I, I don't know. I know you think this is a wacky call, but the reality is... A lot of the things that you've said on the air, off the air, and just listening to you and the struggles you've gone through really helped me get through this, and it's been unbelievable. A lot of things I always thought I would do, like write all these stories that I had sitting around and all these different things that I always wanted to explore, I'm finally doing them, and it's just because I, would, I got out of the, 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 the hammock and the seatbelt of being in that world, you know? Thank you for saying that. And Yeah, you're right, man. It is... When you get out of the seatbelt of being in that world, you can do almost, and it sounds corny. It does. That's why I, I, I prefaced it with, like, this is not a wacky call. The reality is, is you know what, I, I don't know what the future holds, but the reality is what I was doing and how I was living was not going to get me anywhere, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I lost a lot of things on my way, and I don't want to lose any more, you know? Well, you know, I realized, too, like, when, they, when I first got sober, they, I was 18, I was, you know, so I didn't have a whole lot of living behind me. But they were like, well, it gets better beyond your wildest dreams. And I was like, oh, fuck you. I just thought it was such a line of shit. And then when I look back over it, and, you know, it, sometimes it, you have to stop and kind of reflect. Everything they told me would happen has happened. Every good thing, again, within reason, that I was willing to work for, I've gotten. Everything I've wanted. I have gotten. If I've been willing to do the legwork, you know, and as my original sponsor said, 99% of life or whatever is just showing up. If I was willing to show up and be present and do the work, I, I got what they said I would get. So uh, thanks for the call, man, and good luck. I'm happy to hear that. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, take care, bro. Bye. Uh, Rob in Atlanta, I cannot see, due to our software lag, what you want. It's going to be a big surprise. Hi, Rob. 
Hey, Jim. Uh, I just want to ask you, how far into your comedy career, you know, when you were first starting out, did you start to feel like you were kind of catching on and getting it and were actually, you know, funny? You know, it's it's hard to say because there's different... I found that I hit different little mile markers. Like at first, um, I was you know very scared, and I didn't think I'd ever be good at it. But then I made a few comedians laugh, like Jim Florentine and and Bob Levy and other guys like and Eric McMahon. These guys that I came up with. <clears throat> so when comedians began to respect me and think I was funny. Then I started to feel like, wow, I mean, I do have something. Uh, or I work with Otto or this guy Stan the Man. You know, like, like so the comedian's approval originally made me think I was funny. At first it's the audience. Okay, I got some crowd laughs, so I feel funny. But then when the comedians start to laugh, you're like, fuck, I really am funny. And then um, as, as time goes on, you, you start to – so maybe, you know, a few months before an audience member maybe think I was a little funny and maybe uh, a year – or so, maybe more, before the comedian started to make me think I was funny. And then as time went on, a couple of years here and there, it becomes, uh, well, now I'm not just emceeing, I'm featuring, maybe four years in. I'm doing a half hour. That made me think I was funny. You know what I mean? It's all these little mile markers. There's never one definitive moment where I would go, okay, now I'm funny. Because what gives me satisfaction today or confidence won't necessarily do it in a year from now. So I, I kept needing more and more and more. So after a while, hey, yeah, it's great. Comedians think I'm funny or you're the audience. But am I being funny with what I think is important to talk about or what I want to talk about? So that became a new thing. So when I learned how to express my opinion honestly and uh, get laughs, with it, then I became really convinced I was funny. You know, so I'm sorry to ramble, but it just it, it was ever changing. Not at all. Uh, why hey. are you, have you been doing stand up for a while? Yeah, I said it about eight months. Okay. You know, and I, I kind of go through, it kind of feels like weeks where I feel like some weeks I'm really catching on, I'm hilarious, and the next week I feel like, you know, I feel like, what the fuck am I doing? Oh, sure, yeah. Welcome to the world, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, one more quick question for you, just out of curiosity. Sure. Um, at the Punchline in Atlanta, your headshot, it, there's a wall of all the headshots, all the comedians. I was thinking, of, by the way, not to interrupt you, I was thinking of that wall of headshots in the Atlanta Punchline this morning. It's funny. Really? Yeah, it's funny you should bring that up. What, what, which, 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 what are my headshots? Well, your headshot is right, right by the men's bathroom, like by itself. Uh, there's a wall outside of it that has all the other comedians, and then there's just yours right outside the men's bathroom. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> And I was just wondering if that was if there was something to that, or, or if that was like an uh, inside joke or something. No, I have no knowledge of why it's there, but I appreciate the club putting it there. Yeah, please take a photo of that and Twitter it, would you? Yeah, I will. I will. All right, hey, thank so you. One more thing, I y love yes. the last two specials, man. They're getting better with everyone. I'm really enjoying them. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. I was I was happy with them too. Thanks for the call, Rob, and uh, good luck. The eight months is very new. It seems like forever when you're doing it eight months. Like, wow, I'm almost a year. But again, as you look back on it, you'll realize you're just uh, you're, you're you're very brand new, and you just it's a fun process, you know, to to, to keep rediscovering, or peeling these layers off what I'm comfortable talking about and what I'm good talking about, and it's a great uh, journey, man. So keep it up. Eight six six nine six nine one nine six nine. Thank you. Want to call and talk to Jim? Yes, thank you, Iraq. Uh, yes, Jessica in Bayport. Hello. A lot of comedian calls today, which is rare. Uh, what's up, Jessica? Hi. How are you? Hi, Jimmy. Good morning. I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, okay, so me and my boyfriend are both comedians, and uh, I've been doing it about four years. He's been doing it about seven, and there is some competition. Um, there is some fighting between us. I just want to know, have you ever dated another comic, and do you have any advice for that? Yeah, I dated one comedian. Uh, we dated for, I, I want to say, a year and a half or two years. Um, we were very good friends first. We okay. were, We were, you know, she was one of my favorite people before we dated, and, um, you know, I, in a way, I'm happy we dated because it's like I think she's so brilliant and funny. I'm happy she's my ex-girlfriend. And a, a part of me wishes we didn't because I'm such a shithead. The relationship collapsing was almost all my fault. Like, literally, because I'm an argument. She'd be looking for solutions in the arguments, and I was always looking to keep it going. Like, I'm a dick. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and she was actually really, she wasn't perfect, but she was really good in the relationship. And we so never we break up then, is what you're saying. No, 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 no. Because we I never fought care. about, <laughs> we, we never, we didn't have any competition. Because I've been around a lot longer than her. So okay. it, it's not that I'm so far advanced, because she's about to be on a television show, so she's going to shoot past me. Um, but I was 
was just in a stage where I was on the road headlining and she was, you know, doing like l- a shorter sets here in New York. And her confidence as a stand up wasn't nearly what it should have been because she's so much funnier than she thought she was. And I would always tell her, like, you, you're fucking crazy. You're really funny. Like, don't ever think that way. So we never fought about comedy. Um, cause oh, okay. I, I, I really liked her act a lot and I, I thought she was great and, and hilarious. Uh, our fights were all because I'm a sh- 80% of them, maybe 90% were because I'm an argumentative, insecure fucking idiot. But, um, <laughs> what do, do you, what do you guys fight about? Cause you should be kind of supporting each other. Well, yeah. I mean, most of the time we do support each other, but you know, every now and then we'll get angry at each other and he'll call me an amateur and shit like that. So Yeah, that's um that that's kind of shitty. Uh, I remember one time she and I were fighting and she really hurt my feelings one time. I I had done some dickhead scumbag move and uh, she was screaming at me. She's like, "I can't fucking believe I used to look up to you." And I was like, "Oh. Oh, that one got me." Like cuz we were friends yeah. and she thought I was a really good guy. But, um, you know, yeah, you shouldn't be tearing each other down as comics. I mean, there's enough fucking problems with the audience doing that and, and enough with hecklers. And you don't need to insult each other's art, as it were. You know, that's, we should both kind of be there for each other. And, and you'll never get a part that's meant for him. And he'll never get a part that's meant for you. You know, you're not a gay couple who will both be competing for the same roles. Then, you know, you're not going to go out for a sitcom read where they're going to go, we needed a janitor of any gender. They're going to say, we need a woman between the ages of 18 and 50, or we need a man between the ages of 35 and 70, you know, whatever. Yeah. So just enjoy each other. There's no competition. You can fucking go out and do gigs together. That's great. Yeah, we do. All right, cool. <laughs> and then it's always weird when, like, one of us bonds and the other one kills, and we're, like, secretly, like, ha-ha. <laughs> well, look at Rich and Bonnie. Rich and Bonnie, to me, are a great couple because they're both really caustic, kind of shitty people, but so funny and they both have amazing senses of humor about each other like you know Voss there's no one takes a fucking joke better than Voss and uh and he hits Bonnie really hard and she laughs she doesn't get she's not a baby about it you know I I think that their type of relationship is really uh good at least as far as comedy is concerned so good luck to you well thank you very much I love you Jim all right thank you Jessica uh let's see Ted in Boston uh, who wants hey, to? F- Jimmy. Hi, buddy. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Ted? Good, thanks. Um, I am not a comic, first of all. Okay. Um, I am just a, you know, uh, I appreciate great comedy. And, and you hear those questions, name four people you'd love to take out to dinner. You are one of them, and let me explain to you why. Thank you. Not only do I find you incredibly funny, and anyone can tell a dick joke, but sometimes... Some of the comments you make under your breath are brilliant. <laughs> um, as an example, I was just listening to ONA, and you actually can carry on a brilliant conversation about Hamas, or you can carry on a brilliant conversation about the Middle East. You're very knowledgeable, and I'd like to know, what is your educational background? Thank you. And by the way, as you're saying that, Half the audience is looking at the radio going, he's a fucking idiot. Well, he doesn't know anything about the Middle East. They're screaming at you for saying that. So I, while, while I, appreciate, I appreciate you saying that, half the audience right now wants to choke you because they think I'm a retard. But um, my educational background is I dropped out of high school after a suicide attempt, uh, a fake suicide attempt. It was more of an attention whore thing. In January of 86, I went to rehab when I was a senior and that kind of fucked me up. Like, when I went back to school, I could never kind of catch up. And I just kind of stopped going my senior year. So I'm a high school dropout, and I went to one semester of community college, which was supposed to translate uh, high school and college credits. So I, I took problems in statistics. I took Western civilization. I took um, uh, English, and I took uh, biology. And I got a B in three Fs. A B in English, which was merciful, and F's in the, in the other ones. So um, never got a diploma. But thank you for the call, Ted. I appreciate it. No problem. All right, be good, buddy. I appreciate your call. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Luke in Florida. Hey, Jimmy. How are you doing today? Hi, buddy. Hey, I, I just want to start off by saying everything you do is, uh, is pretty awesome. Man. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Luke. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask you. I, I broke up with my ex-girlfriend uh, of about three years. Um, about a year and a half ago. And since then, uh, I've gotten back on the horse, man. Uh, started going on a lot of dates. Um, and right now, I'm at a point where I've gone through several chicks and I 
I still text probably 10 to 15 of them yeah. on a regular basis. And, you know, they'll go out with a lot of those girls. And unfortunately, I still keep holding on to my ex-girlfriend, even when I'm fucking these chicks. Yeah. Like, I still keep holding on to her. And, like, a lot of these girls that I date are good girls, you know, smart, funny, attractive, caring, all that stuff that I've looked for. But I can't seem to shake the ex, man. Well, what is your, is your ex with anyone else? I'm sorry? Is your ex-girlfriend with anyone else? Um, I believe now she is. For a while she wasn't, now she is. Now is it, do you, do you want her more than now that she's with someone else? Um, you know, now I've actually started to let her go. Now okay. That she's, you know, with somebody, but like for a long time before, you know, I was thinking, oh, if she's staying single for me, we're going to get back together. Now she's, you know, kind of with somebody else. Carlin, um, ha- George Carlin had a line. It's part of my interruption. George Carlin had a line one time where he was talking about Americans and how we have, like, you know, uh, I think it was like you know, SUVs and all these cars and vehicles. And he went, too many choices, America. It's not healthy. And I think that's the way it is with women once in a while. It's I want to keep the ex-girlfriend on a leash or, or, or on a, a string, and I want to keep the new one. On. I want all of these choices. And when I have so many choices or options, I fuck up and I panic and I don't take any of them or I wreck all of them because they can all sense that I'm a greedy shithead uh, playing them against each other and just balancing out which one I wind up with. And they get tired of their lives being treated that way. So maybe that's a problem, too. You know, it's hard to let go of the ex sometimes because, again, we don't want to realize, fuck, I made a mistake that I can't change. Right. Makes a lot of sense, man. And I, you know, I feel like I'm sabotaging these new relationships as well, almost you know, subconsciously uh, when I look back on it. So I want to get away from that and find somebody else. But, uh, but yeah, letting go sometimes it's difficult. It is hard because I still I'm, I'm still very close to my ex-girlfriend, my most recent ex. Uh, we broke up a couple years ago, and she's still m- one of my closest friends. We text every day. We don't fuck when I see her, even though I still think she looks really good. It's not, it's not about that. Um, and it's hard. I have not been able to find anyone else. I, I do not have a girlfriend. I don't think she has a boyfriend. Um, sometimes it's hard when you have that, that connection to just kind of let each other go and move on. It's really difficult. Yeah, man. I, and we were, you know, we lived together for a long time. We we did a lot of things. We grew up together in a lot of aspects. So, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe one day we'll end up together. Maybe we won't. But uh, Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. Yeah. About me and you. Yeah, and I. I. All right. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah, man. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Like I said, you're awesome, man. Uh, keep on doing what you're doing. And, uh yeah, man, I appreciate you, uh, you taking the time today. Take care, buddy. <clears throat> you know, because uh, the thing is, when you have a relationship that goes awry, people always say, like, oh, what's the best gift to, to give a woman in your life? Like, what is the best gift? Now, sometimes the best gift is to remove yourself from her life because you're shit. For me, the best gift I can give a woman is to exit the relationship because I'm a louse. Uh, the best gift for any occasion, however, or even no occasion, if you're not a louse, it's an I love you gift. Now, what is an I love you gift? You're all saying, Jim, what's an I love you gift? I have an answer. It's a gift that says without words how much she truly means to you. Because how often do you show your girl how much she means? Once in a while, you know, you walk in the house with like a half a Cialis rod and you wave it at her. That's not an I love you gift. That's an I love me gift because then she blows you and you feel better about yourself. No, showing her how much you love her is what's important. Uh, You want to show her how much you appreciate her and how much you value her. And it's something she can keep forever. And she can look at every day to remind her of how much you love her. So when you do something lousy, she can just look at this gift, whatever it may be, and go, oh, God, he does love me. Yes, he fucked my sister right where the shit comes out. However, he does love me. Beautiful piece of diamond jewelry will last forever. And it shows her exactly how special she is to you. Steven Singer has the perfect I love you gifts for the women in your life. Go to IHateStevenSinger.com. Steven has made finding the perfect gift very, very simple. You go online to IHateStevenSinger.com. He's got free and fast shipping, and it's available to all listeners. And with Steven's easy return policy and great guarantee, it's risk-free shopping. It's really, it's no bullshit with Steven Singer. He wants you to be happy. He would rather just give you something back that you you don't like or is fucked up than than deal with you not liking him or shopping there again. Steven Singer Jewelers has the best selection of diamond jewelry, best guarantees and warranties, and amazing service. So make sure for the next occasion you get her that 
perfect I love you gift from Steven Singer Jewelers. It's at the other corner of 8th and Walnut if you happen to be in Philly. Uh, or on the phone, it's one eight eight eight. I hate Steven Singer because you're maybe one of those people that won't be on a computer because you're a creep and you fucking, you know, you download illegal porn off news groups and you've kind of had to put your computer down for a while. So just pick up the phone, one eight eight. I hate Steven Singer. Or if you're a decent person and uh, you're on the computer, perhaps you're a sex addict and you have one of those fucking uh, those blockers that protect you from all those filthy sites and you still have internet access, you can go to IHateStevenSinger.com because Steven Singer shines through on any computer. <laughs> All right, let's see. Q, dealing with obsessions. How are you? Steven Singer shines through on any computer. How's that for a fucking slug line? Good, E-Rock? He just canceled. <laughs> yes, sir. What's up, Q? That was awesome. I appreciate that little segue. That was cool. All right. Hey, Jimmy. Uh, first, I'd like to say, man, I really do like and admire you a lot. been listening to the show for a long time. Thank you. following you for a long time as well. You really remind me of like a uh, modern day Woody Allen. Uh, oh, thank I'm a, you. I'm a big Woody Allen fan, and I see a lot of a lot of uh, similarities as yeah. far as your well. If I had a stepdaughter, I'd definitely remind you of Woody Allen because I know I'm just as weak as he is. But thank you. <laughs> but uh, but on with obsession, though. I'm one. I um. It's it's kind of hard for me to step away from obsession. Um, my thing, like E Rock, I'm a uh, action figure collector, and sure. I obsess over it a lot. So, you know, being a married man and, and everything and responsible adult, try to switch my switch it and try to calm it down and just focus dead on work. But now I'm at the point to where I obsess over work, just being so competitive and, you know, drawing up competition at work, even right. when it's not really there, you know. So I was wondering, it's like, even though I'm focusing it on work, is it still a good thing in your opinion? I mean, any kind of obsession, like I, I have a work obsession too, as, as well as many others. It can be unhealthy because it begins to take the place of, like I'm getting the feelings from the obsession that I probably should be getting from other things that are healthy or human. Um, but like what's the difference between a, a, an, an ardent collector and an obsession? I don't know. It, it's a tough question because... I collect, uh, like I get celebrity photos. That's one thing I happen to cut. You can see I'm a collector. I'm obsessed with them. Um, is it unhealthy? Maybe because I put too much value in these unimportant things. But the offshoot is I do get good material out of it. I get funny stories out of it. I, you know, I get a cool picture out of it if it works. So there's something to be gained from it. However, the obsession itself can still be a little unhealthy. And you don't want to be obsessively competitive at work because then you're unpleasant to be around. Um, anytime you're doing something to kind of fill a vacuum left by something else, it can be healthy for a little while, but then that just becomes the new obsession. So then you need to tone back on that and you leave another vacuum. Like um, when you quit drinking, doing drugs, or if you quit gambling, a lot of times people eat. When they quit smoking, people put on a lot of weight. I mean, Bob Kelly put, put weight on because he quit smoking. Um, so you go from one obsession to another obsession. I put weight on when I quit smoking. Um, you know, it was all about that oral fixation. And it's not just because your food tastes better. It's because... Like when, whenever you smoke, you're, you're calming your nerves. You're, 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 you're healing this, this, this craving you have for something, for something, this drug. And um, when you don't have that, you heal that craving with food or other things. So usually replacing obsessions gets kind of uh, hairy quickly. So I would be careful of doing that. Um, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with collecting action figures. If it's an obsession, you probably don't want to do it, though, if you're married. Because, like Sam, we'll get divorced eventually. He's now married to a really hot chick. But believe me, he's a 30-year-old man with fucking awful dumb feet and an afro and wrestling toys. She's going to be fed up within six months. True. <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. I All right. appreciate it. All right. Good luck. Yeah, yeah don't be too competitive at work. Because then nobody wants to work with you when you're that competitive. You know? Then, you, then you're like fucking like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You're like Ed Harris and that. Fuck you! <laughs> How mad he got. All right. Let's see. Uh, Jay in Pittsburgh picked up on a network I gave him. Hello, Jay. Hey, man. How you doing? Good, buddy. How are you? Yeah, I called up a few months ago. I'm the guy that's in the Army and uh, going to be getting out next year. Okay. And uh, I was doing the online radio, and um, I actually... I got picked up by an online radio slash podcasting network. Let me, did you call because uh, you weren't thinking about, you were thinking about leaving your military career and you weren't sure? 
Yeah, and okay. I wanted to clarify because I heard something uh, like a few days after on one of the shows. <clears throat> I'm not getting out completely. I'm going to go into the reserves. Okay. I'm not completely walking away from 14 years, but, you know, uh, going to find a, a different day job. Right. But I wanted to say uh, thank you. Um, you know, I really took your advice to heart and, and pushed and, and just clawed at trying to turn this hobby into something more than just a hobby and uh yeah i got picked up a few uh few weeks ago from a uh, veteran friendly uh, uh online radio network and uh that's you great know, i want to i want to you know say thank you and um you know i just uh took your advice to heart well congratulations man that's good for you i'm, I'm not talking to guys probably gonna run us out of satellite radio like five years from now fucking jay from pittsburgh will have this spot and we'll be out on our asses but congratulations man i'm, I'm happy that you uh, that you pursued it a little bit, and um, you know that you're getting something out of it. So good for you. And it's smart that you didn't totally walk away from all those benefits and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, man. And uh, you know, in the future, if you ever, you know, once you're fired from satellite radio from this new management, <laughs> you want to be a guest or something on the show. You know, I would I would love to have you on. And uh, thank you, Joe. You know, like I said, I've been I've been listening to you for you know ten years, and uh, you're special in Boston a couple weeks last week was uh hilarious man thank you you uh you're awesome dude i can't say thank you enough for uh being an inspiration and a drive for for my own career well thank you jay and good luck to you and i, I the special is called american degenerate i'm actually having american degenerate shirts made because my uh producer came up with such a fucking cool t-shirt that i think people will actually like these and buy these but it's, thank you it's different from the poster uh, no, my face is not on it. Um, it's got that flag, though. My name, Jim Norton, American Degenerate. It, yeah. it actually looks pretty cool. Nice. And I say that. Watch me sell none of them. Uh, I don't know exactly what this call is, so we're just going to... I like to say, uh, like, this is like Jeopardy. What was it called? Potpourri. <laughs> when that snooty Alex Trebek goes to the one that, that could be anything. Or Potluck. It's called Potluck. That's it. Potpourri. It's... No, they say Potpourri on Jeopardy. Oh, they do? Yeah. Oh, thank God. I thought my They don't fucking... say Potluck. They don't? Oh, no. yeah, you're right. You're right. What am I talking about? I'm a true white trash. This Hello, Mike, Mike in New, New Jersey. Jersey. Hey, Jimmy. How's it going, man? Good, buddy. Love you. Thank you, man. Hey, uh, yeah, so my wife, I found out in January, she's a lesbian. Okay. She moved, she moved out about four months ago or so. Uh, didn't talk to her until last week. I haven't seen her until How last How long week. were you married? Five years. Do you have kids? No. Okay. And then uh, saw her, and we ended up uh, making out at the end of the night. Okay. So just really fucking confused, man. Don't know how to. <laughs> well, do you <laughs> think she, do you, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Do you think she's a real lesbian, or do you think that she just is bisexual and wanted out of the relationship with you? Well, when I found out that, she, you know, like, um, she said that she was bi. She, you know, she wasn't sure. So I think she's still going through, like, some, you know, thing, you know, trying to figure out herself. And all that crap. And, you know, which I respected. And I was like, all right, let's work this out. Let's do, you know, let's, uh, you know, go to marriage council and all that. And we tried for a bit. And then, you know, at, like, I don't know. She just kind of, she left me four months ago. And then. Well, that kind of sucks. I'm sorry to hear that. That stinks. Do you want to get back with her or do you want to move forward the divorce? I'm not sure. Like, I, like, I kind of made up my mind a month ago. But, you know, at the same time, it's kind of tough. I'm not sure. Well, is it easier for you that she left you for a woman and not a man? Yeah, oh, it's definitely easier, Jim. Yeah, because if some, I don't know if she's gay, but if she is or if that's her inclination, then there's, if, if, and if that's truly who she is, then there's no human power or there's nothing you could have done differently yeah. to make her not well, that way. That's who she is. Exactly. That's what makes it a little easier. I mean, because I fucked up a long time ago. I mean, I never cheated on her or anything else like that, but I'm an alcoholic. Okay. And I, you know, I tried to, uh, uh, so all of 2012, I was pretty much sober. You know, I was doing the, the meetings and all that stuff. Good, good. And then, uh, you know, and then everything hit me in the beginning of January with her. You know, now I'm off the wagon again. Okay. Uh, so you basically, were, you used her as an excuse to drink. Well, well, she withheld sex from me for a year and a half during a marriage. Okay, that stinks, and maybe there's big problems in the marriage, but that's still no reason to put a loaded shotgun to your head or a loaded pistol and, and play Russian roulette because she's not fucking you or she might be gay. Like, those are awful things. I'm not saying that they don't hurt, but why would you, you know, again, put a, a loaded gun at your own head because she's fucked up? 
Well, that's true. I mean, well, you're right. <laughs> to me, I would suggest getting back on the wagon first and foremost because uh, that, to me, that's probably – if you're an alcoholic and you're back to drinking – then the marriage is an important thing, but I would say getting sober is the more important thing because whether or not you work out with her, I mean, how good are things going to be if you're still actively alcoholic, uh, alcoholically drinking? Yeah. Well, yeah. No, it, it wouldn't be good at all. I, I know I need to get back on the wagon, and I realize that. And I'm trying to, but it's just really difficult, especially you know, since seeing her uh, last week. You know, for the first time in four months, and then making out with her, it was like kind of like really confusing. Yeah, that is, uh, especially if she's saying she's gay. But then again, you're still her husband, so you know, it's. Uh, I guess uh, you know. I understand why she would make out with someone who she's married to. Do you think that she just? Did you put weight on or something, or were you kind of smelly? Or I mean, I'm not asking you to be a dick, but if she didn't want to fuck you for that long, were you doing anything that made you kind of gross to her? Yeah, well, I, I did gain weight, and I have actually recently lost a lot of weight. I've actually lost so many pounds. So you, oh, that's good. Congratulations, man! But you were basically coming home eighty pounds heavier and drunk. Um, no, well, you know, the, here's the thing, man. I, I really tried to work on it. You know, I, I was being sober. I was getting, you know, slimmer, and I was, uh, I was doing everything I needed to do, right? And even then, she wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't fuck me. She actually called me too fat to fuck at one point. Jesus, you know? what a bitch! Yeah. <laughs> but then you know I was working on everything you know I was uh, you know trying to trying to work on all that stuff and uh, doing a good job and she didn't she told me she didn't forgive me until I found out she was a lesbian and then that night we actually fucked. That's weird. Like uh, yeah, I, the fact that she said that. you're too fat to fuck. I mean that's really an awful thing to say to somebody. Yeah, that was like that was like maybe like. You know, six months into the year and a half, you know, hiatus from sex. Um, yeah, that's kind of shitty because she could have said, like, look, you know, maybe if you went to the gym a little bit, we could work out together. Yeah, There's a nicer, much more diplomatic way to say that you're too fat to fuck. Yeah, there, there, there definitely was a, a better way to put it, I guess. But, you know, you know, uh, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Sure. You're married to this woman. You're, uh, she says you're too fat to fuck. She holds out pussy for over a year. She then leaves you and says, I'm a lesbian, and then throws you a fuck that night and then makes out with you four months later. What is it about her that makes you want to be married to her? She sounds shitty and selfish. Uh, I don't know, man. You know, you don't choose the people you love, right? Um, yes and no. I don't know how true that is. I think sometimes you don't and you fall in love and you get, you know, hit with the thunderbolt like Michael in the original Godfather. But I do think it's a choice. Yeah. I, I do think we choose who we love and we choose who to be around and we choose who to spend time with. Yeah. We're not victims of circumstance when it comes to love, especially if you don't have any children together. Maybe her, maybe her taking off is a blessing in disguise because you, you invested five years but, uh, you know, hey, look, thank God you didn't have 30 years with her and then she does that shit with you. And then she doesn't fuck you for 10 years. I mean, who needs that? Yeah. Get sober again. Stop fucking around. Go to some meetings or whatever you got to do to get yourself sober. You lost the weight and, and fucking keep on going, man. Great advice, Jim. All right, Great good luck. Advice, but seriously, try to get sober again. That's great that you had it for a while. And uh, are you fucked up? It happens. People fuck up. Doesn't mean that you're doomed to a life of fucking up. Just, you know, you're, you're on an elevator and it's only going down. You can get off at any floor. All right? Great, Jim. All right, Love be you. good, buddy. Good luck. Take care, man. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gary in New York. Oh, no. Lost his job and wants advice. <laughs> Gary from down the hall. <laughs> Jim, I, wasn't, I, did, I had a job. I thought I did really good. And, and they can't me. And now I'm on that elevator. Down. All right, well, what I would suggest, and thank you very much for the call, Gary, I would suggest just, you know, polish those glasses, put on a wig, and keep on going. I'm going to tell you, poor Gary. Gary's a good egg. I feel bad for him. Poor no, you don't. I do actually like him. I mean, you know, there's times he did things, and I was like, what the fuck? But, I mean, you know, by and large, I think he, he did the best he could, and he tried, and I had some nice chats with him, so all That's right. Fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I I did like him. I still do. I, I did like he's fucking get hit by a bus. Uh, Mike in Brooklyn, men in divorce and how to deal with custody issues. Ah, something I have zero experience with. Hello, Mike. Hi, how are you? Jimmy? I'm good, buddy. Thanks for calling. Um, I'm a 43 year old man, divorced. Uh, don't get a divorce. Um, 
you know, my, my topic is, you know, basically the bastardization of fatherhood. Yeah. Um, the courts don't take us serious. They take our money. They take our custody. They believe the women, whatever they say. And, you know, I haven't seen my kids in two and a half years. And all because of a false arrest. And no matter what I do, I mean, the kids are resistant, but no matter what I do, the courts don't want to uh, give me visitation. And it happens over and well, over. Well, let me ask you a question. Court. And again, I, I, I don't know your circumstance. Even Alec Baldwin, even a guy married to Kim Bassinger with that kind of money was screaming about how they're unfair to men. They really are, I think, uh, unfair to men. I, I think that... Uh, What's happening, like with with racial issues, I think a lot of the, the divorce issues, we are paying for what has happened before us. Like, I think the fact that for women didn't vote or work for so many centuries and they were just staying at home and, you know, fucking whipping up eggs and making a cake uh, and they had shit. So if a guy left and they had nothing. And now it's, you know, 50 years later, the courts are acting like nothing has changed, which is nonsense. Of course, a lot has changed. The so, pendulum has swung so far. To the other side, yeah. my wife is working. She's collecting spousal and child support. I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and yeah, it's not. It's not isolated just to me. I hear it over and over. I see it in the courts. My friends. And at what point does this stop? Well, it's, let me ask you how how uh, how long were you married and how old is your kid? Uh, my kids are twelve and eight. I was married for for. This will be 14 years. I'm still not even divorced. Okay, now why no visitation? What happened that they said no visitation? Well, my. My wife, uh, right after she caught uh, breast cancer, she uh, basically isolated the kids from me. Um, and more and more, I don't know if you ever heard of the term parental alienation. Uh, I can imagine what it is. I've never heard a phrase it's, like it's that. Basically, when you, when you um, you know turn one parent against the right. other. Right now, were you, were you already separated when she got breast cancer? Uh, no, I went through it with her. Okay. Um, I mean, we had a rocky marriage, but I. Why had, did you I cheat? Know. What was that? Did you cheat? No. Oh, okay. No. No. Uh, believe me, I can't even handle one. I'm going to handle <laughs> Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, um, you know, and I think she was just very, very angry that I was leaving, and she turned the kids against me. Oh. They're very resistant. And now the courts are saying, all right, go to family therapy. But the family therapy, of course, it, you know, will cost like 3000 a month. The therapists want like three, four hundred dollars an hour. Wow. And I'm tapped out at this point, and the courts look at me and say, so what? I'm basically living on fifteen hundred dollars a month in, in New York City. She's got to be living on about between her and my salary about eight thousand a month. Wow. Now, and what was the false yeah. arrest for? Uh, well, we went into the bedroom. We were talking about me leaving, and as soon as I got to the point where I was talking to the kids uh, about the kids and say, "Please don't turn them against me," she said, "I don't want to talk no more." So I'm standing to the side of the door, and she opens the door, hit against my foot, bam, right on the phone. Hit against my foot. That's it. I said, you can. She said, you won't let me out, which I'm kind of, you know, seeing now. I think she planned all this. Right. You know, and, you know, I mean, of course, they have to take out someone because that's the rule now. And he took me out. I was in lockup for, you know, 28 hours. Um, had to fight that. Uh, then the orders of protection came. And it's been two and a half years. You know, you, you know, they don't think that men can parent. They don't think they don't value us. The court. Yeah society i mean i love my kids just as much as uh she does i could be a parent just as much as she does but when 85 percent of the time women get custody now you know transfer that to a job 85 percent of the time black uh, white people got a job over black people there would be an uproar but men are not valued they just treat us like dirt well again I mean, we do. We, let's be real honest. Men run the world, and I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, but it, it's the facts. We do. Men run the court systems. They're not run by women. They're run by men. Those I, most of the. I'm sure there's female judges, of course, but most of the people making these decisions are male judges, or or at least half of them are male judges making these horrible decisions. I think a lot of it is just emotional laziness on the part of the legal system where nobody wants to think and examine these things, so people are just looked at like fucking cattle. Uh, you know what I mean? And that's the way it was for so many years. So here's the way it's got to be to balance it out. Next case. Next case. And uh, the only answer I could suggest, dude, because I have no experience in this area, is uh, an attorney. I mean, you, you need an attorney who can really... Uh, well, that, that's the problem, too, is that, you know, her, her method was 
cap them out of all this money. I, I can't can't save for an attorney because I have to actually live off the fifteen hundred dollars, and I can't I can't I don't right now I'm representing myself. You know, I, I, who can afford it? They want a ten thousand dollar down payment. You know, uh, yeah, retainer, yeah. And you know, it's like the catch twenty two. I can't save the money. I can't get an attorney. Is no, there no, anything no. you can do that would make her a bit more amenable to working with you? Oh, she has been, and her attorney has been, just get out of their lives. You don't deserve to be here. Um, and the judge is just going with it. My sons were supposed to be going to therapy. You know, I, I would say, you know, to work their way through this problem, it is a major problem not to have a father in your life, I would say. Sure. And um, <clears throat> I got proof that they only went four times this year. And it is a judge just was satisfied. Four times January, twice in January, once in May, once in June. That's okay. You know, and it's like, you know, at what point do you start, you know, focusing on the mom when after two and a half years? And, you know, it wasn't even that. They, my kids didn't even just isolate me. They isolated my mom. My mom had a stroke. They wouldn't even see my mom in the hospital. No cause. And they had a good relationship. What? You, I, let I, me ask you, uh, to, to, to again, not to cut you off, but because this is very complex stuff. And, and again, I have no experience in it. And the, the, we're not going to find an answer today on why the court systems are the way they are. Again, a lot of it's just fucking shitty, lazy cattle thinking, which, on the, which you know, believe me, dude, there's a lot of most men in these situations are not feeling like they're being treated fairly and they're probably not being treated fairly. But um, if there's nothing that you can do, uh, my only suggestion would be to either go to the therapy or try to save the money to go to the therapy or try to save the money to go to the attorney because I can't think of another answer to give you. I can't think of an answer that makes more sense. Um, and it sounds to me like you're you're ready to snap and you're going no, like, no, no, okay, no, good. No, no, I'm, I'm living on hope. Okay, I'm no, good, good, good. Hope. I'm glad. That's I'm glad. It's I'm glad. All in, it's just all my voice. It's just frustration coming out. I'm not going to snap. Okay, good, good, good. That's not the way to do it. Um, I my only suggestion, brother, would be, and I wish I had a better thing to tell you. Try to save up and go to the therapy, or try to find a therapist that's reasonable or that your insurance will cover. Don't insurances cover family therapy? No, not not mine. I'm you know I'm a teacher, and you know, it only, only covers uh, individual therapy, unfortunately. Well, and then there's so, your, what is your therapist suggested about that? Um, you know, I have a therapist that's willing to work for cheap, but they that I suggest the name. He had already worked on the case, and they say no. Nah, the, you know, my wife says no. Nah, I don't want him. Then I don't want him. So you know that what her technique is is to go towards those expensive ones. This way, knowing that you know we can't afford it. Right, and, and then you have to. Way it prolongs it, and at this point, that that type of behavior should be criminal. I I, I got I got to run, buddy. Cause we only got a couple more minutes before the show. But again, I I, 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 just my, I just wanted to get the voice out because I think it's a huge problem in society. Needs to change. You need it to vent. Well, okay, man, and I hope it works out for you. And again, I wish I had a great answer for you, but uh, just good luck, brother, and hang in there. Have a have a great day. All right, you too, man. Uh, I have one more read, yeah, but I want to get to this guy here who's uh, dealing with sleeping apnea or sleep apnea and has depression. Hi, Robert in Brooklyn. I certainly relate. How you doing, Mr. Norton? Good. How are you? Oh, uh, yeah. As a person who deals with sleep apnea, just lately, you know, I've been dealing with like maybe two years now, maybe getting like an hour or two hours of sleep a night, waking up every 45 minutes, delusional, not be able to breathe. Sure. And just lately, I don't even want to do anything. Like this whole weekend, I spent in my house just tired. Well, what have you done for your apnea? Have you gone for a test? No, I have not. That's one thing I slacked on. But, you know, I've lost weight. I've been losing weight with, you know, 40 pounds, did nothing. I think it made it worse. Well, a couple things you got to do. One, you got to go for a, a sleep study. You have to. I mean, I'm going for my third one at the end of the month, dude, to be tested for what they call an ASV machine because I have complex apnea. If you just have the type where your tongue, which is called obstructive, is blocking your throat, go online. There's a lot of alternatives to masks. Now, I don't know if I can use any because the complex apnea makes it difficult. Um, but they, I use a mouth guard when I sleep sometimes when the mask, because there's this fucking cocksucker place I went, gave me a BiPAP machine, which is not the right machine. So try, uh, go to your dentist and see about getting a mouth guard, uh, which is a little uncomfortable, but you can get used to it, and it'll cost you a few hundred bucks. I don't think insurance covers it, but just see if you can do that, and, uh, and, and you know, hopefully that will help you from swallowing your tongue, and you may get a better night's sleep, and if that doesn't work, then you may have to go for a sleep study, but you should do something. Don't live in a depression about it, okay? Oh, yeah, but I don't know. But also, like, for a person that's always tired, like yourself, like, how do you motivate, motivate yourself to do stuff? Because you're, 
obviously when you're happening, you're still tired and you still you know do a lot of things. I just do it. I mean, there's no real answer. How do I motivate myself? I, I, I feel depressed all the time. Like I said, many times I've thought of hanging myself. I'm like, this is just, I'm not living. Um, I hate this tiredness. I got to go to the gym. I, it's fucking, sometimes I'm just making myself go because I have hope that it will get better. That's basically when I motivate myself, it will not be this way forever. And that's what I keep thinking. Uh, the way technology is changing and everything is changing, I will be able to fix this. So, But you got to take a couple of steps too, man. You know what I mean? You, oh, yeah, you got to go that. for those tests. I definitely got to take that leap to get to sleep. Yeah, you, you, you should because you make – some people have great responses to apnea masks. And in, a, in two weeks or a month, they're used to it, and then it changes their life. Eddie Trunk and Hard Rock Johnny both have apnea masks, and they say their lives are completely changed by them. So a lot of people have great, great success with it. All right? All right. Thank you very much. Hopefully it motivated me. Good luck, buddy. Yeah, I hope so, too. Um, you know, because the question people always ask, like, I don't know if I can wear an apnea mask or not. Well, it's like, well, would you eat a fake apple made from fillers and preservatives? I mean, no, you wouldn't. What about a meatball made that way? Fillers and preservatives. Yuck! Like most people, you want to be able to pronounce every ingredient that goes into your food. If you cook at home, you use real fresh ingredients. Now, if you don't have time to cook from scratch, maybe you're busy. Maybe you work weird hours. Mama Mancini's meatballs is the answer for you. Mama Mancini starts with 100% USDA-graded domestic beef for their meatballs and all natural ingredients like genuine uh, Pecorino Romano cheese, onion, parsley, and breadcrumbs, eggs, and a little salt and pepper. I sound like Clemenza when he's cooking. Hey, Michael, come here. You might have to cook for 30 guys someday. They're real ingredients. That's it. Mama Mancini's famous slow-cooked Italian sauce is made just as simply as their meatballs. They start with the whole Italian plum tomatoes, crush them, and then add natural seasonings, which sounds really good because there's nothing worse than an awful meatball, and there's nothing better than a good meatball. I should put that on a shirt and sell it. Mama Mancini's adds their meatballs to simmering slow-cooked sauce for the perfect combination of flavors. Since 1921, Mama Mancini's has never veered from Grandma Mancini's original recipe. Real ingredients just taste better. Mama Mancini's slow-cooked Italian sauce and meatballs, now available at your local, uh, your local supermarket. I got through that whole read without tripping on words, and I said local supermarket. I apologize. I'm an idiot. I got Mama Mancini's meatballs. You know how hard that is to say? Five times? And I did a good job. And then I say, you're local supermarket. I'm a clod. And now you have to go. I know. I made up of fake ingredients. Shit. That's what I made up of. That's it for me today, folks. Oh, thank you, man. So thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love my 30 minutes set, but I really want to write a new 30 minutes. And uh, everything that I'm writing lately has just been garbage yeah that happens um now what the th are you trying to take stuff and just kind of squeeze it into your set like you don't have to write a whole new 30 and just start over you can always just you know bring stuff and incorporate it into your set and then add to it and then you have 45 yeah i'm trying to make the next step from feature to, to headliner yeah to headline yeah and uh, so i i want to have that extra 30 um just in case some things just aren't hitting do you do any open mics um, constantly. Yeah, that's what I try to do. We're, we're something like, or, or I'll, I'll do the seller. Um, writer's block's a weird thing. Like, the way I do it with stand-up is I kind of have to wait until I'm inspired to talk about something. So after I shot this last special, which we shot at the end of March up in Somerville, um, I, I was 18. I was, you know, so I didn't have a whole lot of living behind me. But they were like, well, it gets better beyond your wildest dreams. And I was like, oh, fuck you. I just thought it was such a line of shit. And then when I look back over it, and, you know, it, sometimes it, you have to stop and kind of reflect. Everything they told me would happen has happened. Every good thing, again, within reason, that I was willing to work for, I've gotten. Everything I've wanted, I have gotten. If I've been willing to do the legwork, you know, and as my original sponsor said, 99% of life or whatever is just showing up. If I was willing to show up and be present and do the work, I, I got what they said I would get. So uh, thanks for the call, man, and good luck. I'm happy to hear right. that. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, take care, bro. Bye. Uh, Rob in Atlanta, I cannot see, due to our software lag, what you want. It's going to be a big surprise. Hi, Rob. Hey, Jim. Uh, I just want to ask you, how far into your comedy career, you know, when you were first starting out, 
did you start to feel like you were kind of a lot of it to you? Oh. And uh, I wanted to thank you for that. You know, I, I don't know. I know you think this is a wacky call, but the reality is a lot of the things that you've said on the air, off the air, and just listening to you and the struggles you've gone through really helped me get through this. And it's been unbelievable. A lot of things I always thought I would do, like write all these stories that I had sitting around and all these different things that I always wanted to explore. I'm finally doing them, and it's just because I would I got out of the, 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 the hammock and the seatbelt of being in that world, you know? Thank you for saying that. And Yeah, you're right, man. It is, uh, when you get out of the seatbelt of, of being in that world, you can do almost, and it sounds corny. It does. That's why I, I, I prefaced it with, like, this is not a wacky call. The reality is, is you know what, I, I don't know what the future holds, but the reality is what I was doing and how I was living was not, going to get me anywhere, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I lost a lot of things on my way, and I don't want to lose any more, you know? Well, you know, I realized, too, like, when, they, when I first got sober, they couldn't think of anything for probably a month and a half. So I was going on every night, just doing, like, fuck jokes and just kind of talking about what was familiar and feeling very uninspired, and I was bombing, and I was walking up the steps every night going, I stink, and I fucking hate my act. And then, um, finally... I went to a bris, and that's what I've been talking about for a while. And it just affected me so much, I just began talking about it naturally. So I think, for personally, I have to wait until I'm kind of inspired. But just keep exploring on stage. Bring up a few topics you want to talk about and play with. And that's how I did it. You're going to bomb a little bit doing it. but um, you know, Or do an open mic where you don't do any of your regular material. Yeah, I really appreciate your time. Good luck, buddy. I know how it is. Thanks. It'll, 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 it'll clear up, too. Don't worry. Just don't uh, give up. Yes, hi, Rick in Brooklyn. Hey, Jimmy. How are you, buddy? I, I love you, pal. Thank you very much. I, how are you? I, I just want you to know that uh, I'm celebrating three years sober, and uh, I, owe, I owe a lot. Jim Norton is a moderately successful comedian, an average author, and a terrible actor. And your chance to speak directly with him. Good afternoon, or is it morning? Depends on when you're listening to this. I was uh, away last week. As you know, we were on vacation. Had quite a delightful week. And um, why does it not show up on the monitor until, like, how come it shows up in that um, one? Because if one? the calls start coming in before we can load that software for you, oh, okay. they show up on the other ones, just not that one yet. All right. Well, a call, uh, line one, we have a call from Donnie. In Boston. Hi, Donnie in Boston, who's uh, having a writer's block. Is that what it is, Donnie? Yeah, Jimmy. How are you? I'm good, buddy. What is it you write? Uh, I'm a stand-up comic. I've been doing it for seven years. I love it. You're the reason why I got into the 